Fit 3 begins with the game of foot. The, uh, the sun comes up in the morning and the lord of the manor dresses to leave. And you get another sense of the audience that the, uh, this poem is being written for. All of those other knights sitting around the, uh, sitting around the court who love a good hunt and are familiar with the rhythms of the day. So there's a certain buoyancy to the, the poem as this comes up. Uh, well before sunrise, the servants were stirring. The guests who were going had called for their grooms, and they scurried to the stables to strap on the saddles, trussing and tying all the trammel and tack. The high-ranking nobles got ready to ride, jumped stylishly to their saddles and seized the reins, then cantered away on their chosen coursers. The lord of the land was by no means last to be rigged out for riding with the rest of his men, and after mass he wolfed down a meal, then made for the hills in a hurry with his hunting horn. Relatively quick and simple, they go out and they hunt some, uh, some deer, and it is all fairly playful, and the deer are very innocent, and they're not particularly scary, and uh, they chase them around, and they, uh, they eventually get one, and that's that. Back at the ranch, as they say, uh, back at the castle, uh, Gowan uh, is lying in bed and wakes up to find that the lady of the house is uh, in the room with him. Uh, she is coming to visit him as he's lying in bed. And it's a... Uh, a little uncomfortable, I think you could say. Um, he uh, he just sort of lays there at first, pretending to sleep, uh, but uh, she's sitting down on the edge of his bed, and they strike up a little conversation. A little awkward. He's sitting there, perhaps not wearing anything at all, uh, under some blankets, presumably. But still, it's uh, it's uncomfortable. It's suggestive. Um, the lady begins this little game of her own, it would seem. Uh, they have a very flirty little talk. And then she glanced at him, laughed, and said her goodbye, then stood and stunned him with astounding words. May the Lord repay you for your prized performance, but I know that Gowan could never be your name. But why, the knight responds, uh, afraid that some fault in his manners had failed him, very concerned with manners, very concerned with what he is supposed to do at all times. His behavior is according to a code. Um, the beautiful woman blessed him, then rebuked him. A good man like Gowan, so greatly regarded, the embodiment of courtliness. Hmm to the bones of his being, could never have lingered so long with a lady without craving a kiss, as politeness requires. Uh, politeness requires that he request a kiss. And she, uh, she goes at it as a kind of attack on his pride, saying, well, you can't really be Sir Gowan, um, because a real knight would have uh, made a move. Here, it's important to remember the, uh, the rules of love, uh, as laid out in, uh, uh, famously in Andreas Capellanus's book, the, uh, the Art of Courtly Love, where uh, a man and a woman are kind of acting out a, uh, a role, uh, a, little, uh, a little play, if you will, with very set rules as to behavior of what they should and should not do. And the first rule in this, uh, he, he, Capellanus lists 31 rules of being a knight or of engaging in the art of love, rather. Uh, the first one is that marriage does not matter. Uh, marriage should not be an impediment to love. And so for lots of reasons, uh, you know, uh, you don't have to worry about, well, oh, gee, the woman is married. I cannot make a move. 
Well, no. And in fact, the rules of love do essentially lay out that in a situation like this, the man is being disrespectful if he does not fall or at least proclaim love for a woman at that moment because she is there, she is ready, she is technically available, married or not, uh, and it is a great offense to her to not have a, uh, a move put on her, if you will. And so she is pricking him on this point and saying, you can't be a knight, you know, what do you Remember the remember the accusation of the green knight uh, in the beginning. You know the I don't see knights. I see beardless children or you know bum fluff bears. <laughs> this is a uh, this is holding up the ideal of knighthood and what they are reputed to be. And she is saying that well it contrasts so much with the reality because you know you, you're not making a move. You're not requesting a kiss. And here is just a chaste kiss that we're talking about. It's all fairly polite. Um, and this is, we're getting what, what in movie language would be called cross-cutting. This is cross-cut between uh, this and the, uh, the deer hunt that, uh, where the deer is captured and the deer is essentially, uh, you know, sliced up and cleaned and, and, and all of that. And it's very obvious that the deer is a kind of metaphor or symbol in some form. And here, in a sense, uh, you could say, I would say, that Gowan is a deer because he has been hunted of sorts in his uh, little bedroom. And the lady is the hunter. The lady, the lady is the aggressor. Now, she gets her kiss. How chaste it is is a matter of some interpretation, uh, but it is a kiss. And okay, Gowan, you call him out on the rules, and the rules say that he should request a kiss, then he's going to play by the rules. He is a knight of Sir of King Arthur's Round Table and the expectations uh, of that civilization are very clear. So at the end of the day, uh, the, uh, the host comes back, he's got a nice big uh, load of venison, lays it out in front of Gowan and says, there you go, that's what you get, that's what I had, uh, that's what I was able to capture out of my hunt. Uh, and I bring it back and give it to you. And Gowan says, well, that's very nice. Uh, and yes, I did get something while you were out. And here it is. I will offer it up. And then he leans in and Gowan kisses the host, the lord of the manor, the other man. This seems fair contract is done, all the forms have been kept up, all of the rules have been followed, everything has been uh, performed to order, as expected. It's a little curious, but okay, you go along. Exactly, again, how, uh, how chaste the kiss is, um, is a matter of some interpretation, and you can take it more or less as you will with that, and many critics go many different ways with it, obviously. Uh, the second day dawns, and the host goes out on another hunt, this time for a boar. Now, a boar is very different than a deer. A deer is kind of playful, and you know, and it's, and it's Bambi, it's, you know, you're having a, a, a happy little time in the woods. A boar can kill you. A boar is dangerous. A boar is what uh, injured young Odysseus when he went out with his grandfather Autolycus hunting. And a boar inflicted a very serious wound in the boy's thigh. Boars have tusks, they, uh, which are almost kind of phallic, if you want to go there. Um, but they're, they're also kind of brutish. Uh, deer are very delicate uh, and light. And a boar 
is very husky and, you know, quite frankly, quite hideous uh, and quite scary, very dangerous. And they hunt that and it, the hunt is uh, much more involved, much more uh, death defying, much more dramatic in its rendering. So you get a sense of the real danger involved here of that this is something much more uh, uh, furious, something much more primal, something uh, much more uh, bloodlusty about the proceedings. And well, they get the boar in the end. And on that second day, Gowan gets another visit from the lady. Um, and this time, it, it, she's got a little bit more of an edge to her. Uh, you know, she questions him again. Sir, if you truly are Gowan, it seems wondrous to me that a man so dedicated to doing his duty cannot heed the first rule of honorable behavior which has entered through one ear and exited the other, you have already lost what yesterday you learned in the truest lesson my tongue could teach. What lesson, asked the knight, I know of none, though if discourtesy has occurred, then blame me, of course. They're arguing about the rules of love. They're, she is saying that, well, he has somehow transgressed them. He has broken the rules. I encourage you to kiss said the lady kindly, and to claim one quickly when one is required, an act which ennobles any knight worth the name. Now remember, the pursuit of love is supposed to be about the pursuit of the ideal. So uh, pursuing love is ennobling in its way. It's not necessarily, he's not, uh, this isn't cheating so much as pursuing a kind of ideal in a religious almost sense, a spiritual sense, certainly, where uh, you are made better through the act of loving, uh, which means that to be a lover is, is essentially equivalent to uh, praying. To, to say a prayer is almost like to declare your love for an ideal. It's essentially the same concept. Um, Dear lady, said the other, Gowan. Uh, don't think such a thing. I dare not kiss in case I am turned down. If, if refused, I'd be at fault for offering in the first place. In truth, she told them, you cannot be turned down. If someone were so snooty or so as to snub your advance, a man like you has means of his muscles. Now, they are arguing again about the rules, about the rules that Andreas Capellanus lays out and it's uh, there he's kind of making a little uh, she's kind of making a legal case saying that well no you're breaking the rules and then she points out that well you know uh, even with this um, uh, as a man you are not obligated necessarily to follow the rules and I understand that because we here are out in the middle of nowhere. We are not in civilization. We don't follow necessarily the same rules. Uh, and here, we generally, uh, the men around here are fairly used to, if they don't get what they want, they always have recourse to rape. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, a man like you has the means of his muscles. All you have to do is smack me around, throw me down, and have at it. Uh, that's what we do out here in the provinces, let's say. Uh, you might not do that in Camelot, but that's the way it is around here. Uh, she is holding him up to the higher standard, however, the reputation of uh, the civilization of uh, the, the Knights of the Round Table. She has heard the legends of his, uh, of, of this organization, of this culture, of courtesy, and chivalrous behavior and she is just pointing out that well we're a little different here and you, you know uh, I don't necessarily have to hold you to that same standard but that same standard is very much what he's going to insist on yes by God said Gowan what you say holds good but such heavy-handedness is frowned on in my homeland that we just don't do that we're civilized Yeah, uh, but they go about a uh, their little 
seduction scene where she is a little bit more ardent in pressing her case, so to speak. Um, and it, it gets a little uncomfortable for Gowan. It's been uncomfortable all along, but it's, it's getting more so. The, the pressure is being dialed up a little bit. Um, the, uh, the, the dynamics of the scene are also important because she is coming in and she is sitting over his, sitting on the side of his bed, essentially over him. She is on top of him. Not, maybe not physically on top, but she is sitting on, sitting on the bed, on the edge of the bed, next to him, and he is lying on the bed. So in effect, she is in the superior position there. You could say, and many people have said, that she is in the dominant position there. She is the one who is going in there on her own agency, and he's always just being found, oh, heavens to Murgatroyd, I am naked in bed. Oh my gosh. Um, she is the aggressor. She is traditional, the, she is in the, what has traditionally been acknowledged to be the male position here. She is, and she's questioning his manhood also throughout. Also, you'll notice, uh, saying, you know, you're not a knight. Remember the, the trash talk of the green, uh, the green knight. And now she is sort of doing that too. You know, you couldn't be Gowan. You're not, that's a real man. And so this question of virility is very important here. And she is sort of treating him like the woman. And it's, uh, it's uncomfortable for him. Um, but he is caught in a bind because he is essentially trying to serve two masters here because the the rules of love uh, obligate him in certain uh, in certain behaviors towards the lady but the rules of uh, fealty the rules of loyalty uh, obligate him to her husband uh, it's awkward for him he is kind of damned as he, if he does and damned if, damned if he does and damned if he doesn't because she is coming to him saying okay the rules say that we can fool around a little uh and you know that kiss can mean many different levels of fooling around uh he knows this but he doesn't necessarily want to betray his host because he is bound by rules of uh, rule, rules of hosting, which have a a ancient, obviously pagan precedent in Xenia that goes back to uh, the Greeks. But also, he frequently invokes Saint Julian or Saint John uh, as the patron saint, the Christian patron saint of hosts and travelers, and uh, trying to give some sort of Christianized concept to, uh, to this situation he's in, to give some form to it, to give some civilized construction to it that he can understand and will spell out exactly what he's supposed to do because in his own heart, and he was told to follow the, uh, the direction of his own heart when he first got there by the host, in his own heart he has no idea what to do. Um, and yet, okay, she trapped him. She says, uh, so the lady tempted and teased him, trying to entice him to wherever her intentions might lie. Tempted and teased him. She is a temptress. But fairly and without fault, he defended himself. No sin on either side transpiring, only happiness that day. So it all ends simply. At length, when they had laughed, the woman kissed Gowan. Politely, then she left and went her own sweet way. So it's all very innocent and chaste, but there was a kiss. So that's a curious act. And you can, again, make of it any number of different interpretations. But has he betrayed her husband? Um, he is supposed to be serving his husband, or serving her husband. And, uh, well, it, it, it's a little 
uncertain. He's trying to very lawyerly split down the, all those hairs uh, of, of, of a legal argument and try and understand how he is supposed to act, how he is supposed to conduct himself. Uh, and he seems to be caught in a bit of a bind. Um, the day ends the same way where uh, the husband comes home, presents this boar to, uh, uh, to Gowan. There you go. And Gowan, well, uh, they, uh, well, they exchange another couple kisses. They, uh, it's a little awkward. It's somehow a little bit more heated also. Uh, and so loving as the lady glanced toward the young lord with stolen glances and secret smiles that the man uh, himself was maddened and amazed, but his breeding forbade him rebuking a lady and though tongues might wag, he returned, her atten he returned her attention all night. Before his friends retire, his lordship leads the, the night, heads for the hearth and fire to linger by its light. And at the end of that day, having, you know, restored their friendship of sorts, and, you know, the game is going well. Um, the lord insisted that he stay an extra, stay an extra night uh, because he is, uh, Gowan is starting to look at the calendar and say, all right, you know, uh, I have to get going because I have this appointment. And he says, uh, no, stay here. I shall, uh, as an honest soul, I swear on my heart, you shall find the Green Chapel to finish your affairs long before dawn of New Year's Day. So lie in your room and laze at your leisure while I ride my estate. And as our terms dictate, we'll trade our trophies when the hunt returns. I have tested you twice and found you truthful, but think tomorrow, third time throws, third time throw best. So in a sense, saying, all right, you know, the, the next one, the rule of threes, uh, the next one, the next night, uh, this will be somewhat more conclusive in their little game. And, well, the... Uh, Everybody goes to bed, all feeling good, but trouble is uh, trouble is starting to brew, and not necessarily a good night's sleep. Next day, husband goes out. Now they're hunting a fox, and a fox again. Consider the difference of the animals. Uh, symbolically, a fox is known to be somewhat wily. Uh, there's that word, uh, or also clever. Um, a clever fox. One is good, in, good at getting in and out of scrapes um, and is somewhat more devious perhaps than the innocent deer or the somewhat brutish uh, boar. It is a, uh, it, it's an animal with some sneakiness um, attached to it. Um, and as the uh, as the fox gets uh, gets hunted, uh, the lady visits for a third time. This time she's dressed a little differently. She's dressed a little bit more uh, temptingly. Her uh, her neck was she wore nothing on her face. Her neck was naked, and her shoulders were bare to both back and breast. Oh. Showing some cleavage, it would seem. Perfectly innocent little visit. Hmm. Um. Oh, sir, how can you sleep when morning comes so clear? And though his dreams are deep, he cannot help but hear. It's like, oh, God, not again. Please. I, uh, I just can't take it. Please leave me alone. Uh, but he is too polite to actually say that. That's just a little peek on the inside wish, the interior desire of the man in this heart, uh, in this moment. And, well, they get, you know, they chat for a little bit and 
They get right to it, however. Laughing warmly, she walks towards him and finds his face with the friendliest kiss. Like, you know, hey, so you're starting out with that. That's, uh, woo. That's, uh, that's something. In a worthy style, he welcomes the woman. In a worthy style, it's all about the superficial. It is all about the style of something, the outward appearance of something. Um, uh, and seeing her so lovely and alluringly dressed, every feature so, so faultless, and com her complexion so fine, a passionate heat takes hold in his heart. So he's starting to, okay, we're amping it up a little bit. Uh, he's no longer just, you know, uh, perfectly in control of his urges. It's starting to get out of hand. Uh, and when was, he was careful to be courteous and avoid uncouthness, and more so for the sake of his soul, should he sin and be counted a betrayer of the keeper of the castle, I shall not succumb, he swore to himself. Again, we're getting a little peek inside there, uh, inside his heart and mind. I shall not succumb, he swore to himself. With affectionate laughter, he fenced and deflected all the loving phrases which leapt from her lips. He fenced and deflected. So that's a, that's a battle terms. Uh, they are parrying thrust and parrying in a, in a fencing match, um, which is a very um, curious war, uh, warfare and game uh, analogy. Fencing has always been really more of a sport than, uh, than warfare. Um, but you get a sense of, okay, he, it's, it is something that they are exchanging back and forth. They're engaging in a little repartee, a little perhaps flirty uh, conversation that is leading in certain ways, suggestive in certain ways, um, but is, you know, it, it has a certain bite to it that perhaps the innocent chats that they were having before, or legalistic chats that they were having before, uh, never really approached. Um, but still, they are concerned with the rules. Uh, she says, uh, you shall bear the blame, said the beautiful one, if you feel no love for the lady you lie with and wound her more than anyone on earth to the heart. Uh, she's saying, you know, the, the rules say that you have to act a certain way and the consequences might be on your head. Unless, of course, there is a lady in your life to whom you are tied and so tightly attached that the bond will not break, as I must now believe. So if he has another woman in his life and she says, okay, she's basically giving him an out. And you can say that here she is trying to play fair and say that, well, you know, if you have a, uh, another intended, another uh, beloved, uh, I cannot encroach on that. That would be, again, a certain betrayal of the rules. The rules are paramount. Um, he doesn't have that, and he cannot lie, so he won't. Um, and it's, uh, it's still amping up a little bit. Stooping and sighing, she kisses him sweetly, more kisses, more stooping, remember, very low cut, so stooping in front of him to give him a little kiss. Uh, it's, uh, it's entering the danger zone, you could say. Um, but she says, you know, I want something else, more than a gift, I, or more than a kiss, I want a gift. And... Uh, he says, well, you know, uh, I don't really have anything with me here. I didn't come with much. I have, you know, just what I came with uh, for the fight, and I don't expect to survive the fight, so it's not like I was going to pack everything I have. Uh, but she says, well, you know, no, I, uh, I, she, he offers her his glove. I don't really want that. I want something that means something. Um, um, and she says that she will give him a gift instead. Uh, she offers a ring, which has 
countless associations and symbolic meanings, and you can take your pick of them. Uh, it is a, uh, I would say most explicitly, a sign of some intimacy, a sign perhaps of sexuality. Uh, a ring can be a, uh, a, the shape of it and what you do with it. Uh, you get the picture. Um, he resists. I have nothing. Uh, uh, he resists. Uh, he does not want. Uh, he doesn't want to get. He swears on his name as a knight. Again, very concerned with the outward formal uh, reputation of the knights of the Round Table, and he's kind of leaning on that as part of his identity. And she says, "You refuse my ring because you find it too fine. I don't care to be deeply in, and don't care to be deeply indebted to me. So I give you my girdle." A lesser thing to gain and she takes from around her waist essentially a uh, uh, what is it's a girdle you could call it um, it's essentially a long strip of cloth that uh, can be used as a girdle can be worn a number of different ways here it seems to be being worn as a belt um, and she uh, she she smiled she sweetly be sweet beseeched Sir Gowan to receive it in spite of its slightness and hoped he would accept. Uh, and she points out to him that uh, uh, there is a, that this is a special girdle, this is a special piece of fabric. It is uh, endowed with magical powers. Uh, you, uh, it will, it might, uh, with luck, it might let him escape with his life, basically, this can save your life in a jam. And what's in the back of Gowan's mind this whole time? Well, his appointment. And he knows, gee, the odds don't look good for me. That big green guy lost his head and just picked it up and rode on out of there, perfectly happy. I can't expect the same. So that girl, magical though it is, uh, that would be nice to have. I don't want to die. But she says not to whisper a word of this gift to her husband. So he can have it, but he can't tell her husband about it. So now he has a very clear choice. He can either refuse the gift outright and go to the Green Knight without a uh, without a you know a magic uh, get out of decapitation free card, or he can go to the uh, to the husband with the gift and say, "This is what I was given today, and now I have to give it back to you." Uh, he doesn't want to do that. Or he can just keep it and not say a word, which is what he does. At the end of the day, the husband comes back, um, presents what he calls a somewhat ratty little fox pelt. Uh, it's not much, it's a little thing. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you eat fox, I don't think you do. Venison is quite good, so that was a good gift. A boar, uh, that's pork meat, essentially, so, you know, uh, that was pretty good, too, and a lot of it. Boars are much larger than foxes, so, you know, uh, a fox, well, the pelt, the skin, the fur, whatever, it's nice, it looks pretty, uh, maybe something, but he feels a little bit awkward because when Gowan exchanges his gift, he just leans in and kisses him three times. He clasps him tight and kisses him three times with as much emotion as a man could muster. But doesn't say anything about the garter. Now, a couple of things. Uh, this is clearly a little bit of a betrayal. It is breaking the rules. It is not honoring the contract that they had struck and the form of their civilization, the, their society, has now been violated. Um, but 
that is a uh, significant transgression that will come back to haunt Gowan in Fit 4. But a note on this last little kiss, too, or the last three kisses. Uh, he clasps him tight and, uh, well, he says, Gowan says, I shall first fulfill our formal agreement, very insistent on formality and correctness and the appearance of everything and keeping to the civilized contract that they are enacting, following the rules, you know, uh, which we fixed in the words and when the drink, uh, in the words, which we fixed in words when the drink flowed freely. Sorry, it's very difficult to read all this alliteration sometimes. Uh, fixed in words also, uh, in words, words are outward signs. They're not necessarily an actual thing. He's not talking about uh, exchanging matters of truth. He's talking about exchanging matters of language of words. So that's a small point, but it's not insignificant. But he clasps him tight and kisses him three times with as much emotion as a man could muster. Okay, uh, with as much emotion as a man could muster is a curious phrase to crop up at this time uh, because this has been uh, a, uh, an example, a repeated iteration of a man kissing a man. And uh, queer scholars uh, dig into this quite a lot and well, literary scholars of all stripes and they, they, they go in many different directions. Of it. But there is a very clear uh, homosexual content going on here on some level and what it means actually is a little bit uncertain. There is that there you, what you have on its surface is same-sex kissing. It doesn't necessarily treat that within the text as anything unusual, although at this point in this juncture, at this third time, there is that little hint uh, with as much emotion as a man could muster, as if they have to fake it a little bit, or at least uh, Gowan has to fake it a little bit in this, to appear passionate in kissing his host. And uh, what you make of that is kind of a free-for-all. You can go in many different dire directions for that. Some, uh, some scholars see that passage and see the, uh, the enactment of uh, gender reversals uh, in the seduction scene where Gowan has made the woman uh, and, and this where, uh, where, uh, where there is a clear uh, uh, homosocial, homosexual content of some form, and they point to the uh, the historical example of Richard II, who was king of England a little bit before the uh, the uh, the likely uh, production of this poem, and Richard II was deposed. And his, uh, we don't know an awful lot about him other than the fact that he was deposed and uh, had some, uh, some problems. A lot of the history we get to it is from Shakespeare's uh, play, Richard II, which makes an awful lot of how he was deposed and this opened up the door to uh, Henry IV, which invites in the whole War of the Roses and inaugurates, uh, you know, most of, at the time, modern British history leading up into Shakespeare's day. But you can't trust Shakespeare on history. <laughs> He's, uh, he, he, he plays fairly fast and loose with a lot of the details. He gets a lot of the spirit uh, of history, but you, know, you can't really take a lot of it. Plus, he was generally, uh, he was writing for an audience uh, in, the, uh, in the Tudor family who would trace their lineage back to, uh, though, uh, to Henry IV and those who would have succeeded uh, Richard II. So getting rid of Richard is, uh, casting him as the bad guy is kind of important for pleasing Shakespeare's audience. Put that aside, Richard II was generally, uh, is thought by many historians to have been 
a somewhat practicing homosexual. Now, certainly that word did not exist at the time. Uh, and the, the s social sexual norms uh, have, uh, have evolved considerable, considerably from that time period. But there is a suggestion, scholars say, that the text in this moment and throughout is exploring the notion of male sexuality and homosocial, homosexual behavior and what are the norms to be reinforced. And here in that, as much emotion as a man could muster, as if, you know, well, he was just faking it. He wasn't really into it. He's just doing it because, you know, the, the weird guy out in the, living out in the middle of nowhere, you know, he wanted to. So, you know, you, you, you do it. So it's prison rules out in the wilderness. He clasps him tight and kisses him three times with as much emotion as a man could muster. That is a kind of uh, cosmetic surgery, I would say, on the act itself. Here the author is stepping in and presenting, uh, or the narrator is stepping in and presenting a characterization of the actor, of the act rather, that uh, might not be uh, all of that consistent with some of the earlier nuance and mystery surrounding this. Certainly, the text is playing with this idea of, uh, of same-sex uh, interaction. But uh, here, it's taking it up a notch, and it's just characterizing it in a somewhat, uh, you could say, prudish way. And maybe this is the, uh, the proper Brits coming along afterwards and editing this this uh, this manuscript after it had been perhaps written or recited a different way it's a little uncertain lots of people have different ideas on this um, if you're interested in that you know is, that that's all fair the uh, it is uncertain though it is very uh, it adds to the total effect of reminding the reader that Gowan is very much on his own in this element. It is an uncertain and unfamiliar wild um, environment that he finds himself in. And he's trying to figure out the rules of how to behave and yet the rules might seem perfectly foreign to him. Uh, how, you know, again, there, there are traditions of male kissing as a sign of loyalty and friendship going among the uh, the aristocratic circles uh, quite a lot so don't read too much into that but what you have is that curious troubling of confidence where something is going on here something is always uncertain you cannot have faith in what you think you know. And it's setting up the big reveal in Fit 4 uh, that Fit 3 ends on that note also. Just teasing the reader a little bit, saying, you know, uh, uh, talking about Gowan going to sleep. Again, you know, uh, he's going to bed has never, has been a little, un a little eventful for him, let's say that. Uh, uh, so the, the narrator tosses off, so let him lie and think in sight of what he sought. In time, I'll tell if tricks work out the way they ought. Which again is a curious little um, stepping in and imposition of the, uh, the narrator coming in a very playful way and flirting with the, uh, with the reader a little bit and saying, you know, yeah, there's something coming. Maybe I'll let you know what's going on. Maybe I'll explain myself. Maybe we'll figure out all these little questions together. But you can't count on it. It's a tease at the end of Fit 3 that propels you more into Fit 4 to finish up and figure out, you know, the what is the big mystery, what is going to happen. Uh, it is playing very clearly on that narrative line. And it's underscoring 
constantly. This, uh, this sense of you think you might know something, but you don't necessarily. Don't get too confident. Don't feel too self-assured. Don't feel too proud and impressed with yourself as you make your way through the world's mysteries. Have some humility. Be prepared for a shock.